Are you, are you having a good time? Everybody enjoying themselves yet? I realize that sounds like a ridiculous question, but seriously, are you finding things to be thankful for? Is there anything in the midst of this chaos and this uncertainty and these, these completely disrupted times, is there anything that you feel blessed by? There's got to be. It's, it's got to be. You can't let that be taken away too. We have to be able to, to find our way to some kind of gratitude in the midst of, of this discomfort and, and this difficult time. I was thinking this past week, I was, I was thinking how thankful I was that I didn't have a big vacation plan this summer. We had a vacation plan, which obviously has gotten blown up, and I realize many of you have had to scrap your plans, but, but Diane and I were able to take a great vacation last summer, and I was thankful that we got to do that last year. I planned a vacation for our 40th wedding anniversary, which was in 2019, and, and I planned to take my wife, take my bride, to Paris. We were going to go to Paris for our 40th wedding anniversary, and we had never been there before, and so I... I thought this is going to be a great, very romantic celebration of our 40 years together. Plus, I love French food. I mean, I like French bread. I like French toast. Who doesn't like French fries? I, as a connoisseur of French food, called a friend of mine who, who owned a restaurant in San Francisco, a very highly respected restaurant, and he's lived in France and been to France many times. And I asked him, give me some idea, because I want to go to the best, fresh, the best French restaurant in Paris. And there's quite a selection. And so he gave me three or four names of, of some Michelin star rated restaurants. And there was one that, that I, as I began to research, I, I decided to call them to see if I could get reservations. It was, for a time, known as the best restaurant in the world. And they only took reservations six months in advance. Fortunately, I was way ahead of the curve, and, and I got a reservation at a, a restaurant called Guy Savoy. You might call it Guy Savoy, but it's really Guy Savoy. And so we went to Paris last May, and we were there, and our second or third night there, we were going to go to Guy Savoy. And so we got all dressed up. This was a big deal, and I had no idea. We pull up in, in, the, in the cab, basically, at the restaurant, and there's, there's a guy on the sidewalk who greets you. And then there's another guy who opens the door because the restaurant is in a museum. So you walk through the museum and you walk up to this wall and there's, there's not even a door there. All of a sudden it opens. And inside is, is a man in a, in a $5,000 suit, perfectly tailored, and, and, and a number of other kind of people of unclear purpose were there. And there's this host of people, and, oh, hello, Mr. and Mrs. Haney, and they guide us in, and they took us to this, this table, and there's, the, the restaurant is basically these rooms. They look like little libraries, little sitting rooms with fine art, and there's two or three tables in each room, and so we were in this one beautiful table, and then, then this swarm of waiters, came an army of waiters, and they were all in these perfectly tailored, perfect fitting, thousands of dollar suits. And I think there was actually a waiter whose only job was to like change the fork. That was, that was, he was the fork waiter. They had, they had at least three sommeliers and, and one master sommelier. There was, there was no, there was no menu. They, they, the, the wine list, though, however, was like an encyclopedia, and you had to specially ask for a, a kind of uh, French wine, and the only one I really knew of was Bordeaux. I said, how about a Bordeaux? And they said, oui, and they bring out this volume, and, and I just said, you choose, which <laughs> was a mistake because the wine cost more than my first car. But, uh, but this, was, this was a magnificent meal. It was 12 courses, and, and the, the food was so amazing. And you know what you eat when you go to the finest restaurant in the world? Anything they put in front of you. I mean, everything was spectacular. It was 12 courses and three dessert courses. And, and as we get up to leave, as, as we're leaving... And, and we settled the bill, and they wish us farewell. We got out on the street, and I realized something amazing. I, I, I had been eating for four hours, and yet I was 
perfectly satisfied. I, it wasn't like I, I was hungry, but it wasn't like I was, I was over full. It was like somehow, mysteriously, they measured my gastrointestinal tract and knew exactly how much food would fit in. It was, it was a perfect meal, let me feeling perfectly satisfied. We walked back to our hotel along the Seine, and it was a beautiful, it was everything that I hoped for. But something happened the next day, and I, and I, and I knew it was going to happen. It's not like you, I couldn't see it coming. But the very next day, something happened. As soon as I woke up, I was hungry again. I was hungry again. What is that about? I just, I just spent a, a considerable amount of money having the perfect meal and eating the perfect food and drinking the perfect wine. You would think I should be done. This should be it. You've done it. You have eaten the food. You're done. So, but the next day, the next day, I was hungry again. What is that about? How is it that, that I, could, I could have the very best possible meal, be fully, perfectly satisfied? And less than 12 hours later, I wanted some bone frites. I was hungry again. You see, we live in a world that was never meant to satisfy us. It was meant to entertain us. It was meant to give us joy. It was meant to bless us. But it was never meant to be enough. We were always born into this life knowing we were meant for more. We were made for more. Because this world was never supposed to be the entree. It's just the appetizer. And we are biologically reminded of that every day. You know how? By our hunger. By our hunger. It is exactly what the Bible talks about over and over again. It talks about this idea of the already. And the not yet that we are living in the in-between, that we are anticipating that more, that better day. We are looking forward to, to being fully satisfied, and, and we already have tasted it, but we aren't there yet. And this is exactly what Jesus was talking about in his stump speech, his Sermon on the Plain, he said, blessed are you who are hungry, for you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. But woe to you who are well fed now, because you will go hungry. And he's describing to us what it means to live in the in-between, in the already and the not yet. Last week, we began a conversation about what does it mean to, to live in the middle? What does it mean to find a bless in the mess? What does it mean to, to be grateful, to be contented, to be satisfied when we know that this isn't fully satisfying, that we, that we will never rest, that this is not our home? We are only passing through. How do we live in the middle? How do we live in the in-between? And last week we began, began considering that. And, and today I want to wrestle with that idea of how do, we, how do we remember to stay hungry and yet somehow find reason to be satisfied and thankful and blessed in the in-between. It's my prayer today that we might find a way to be both and, to be both hungry and satisfied, that we might be already filled, but not yet full. In Luke chapter 6, where Jesus gives his Sermon on the Plain, he says, blessed are the hungry. And he uses the Greek word here, pay now. 
Benaho. Benaho. No. Okay. Misspelled it. Benaho. There. Benaho. I know you were, you're looking at it and you're saying, Dave, remember how to spell the Greek word. But, but the word penao is, is the word it is, the word for hungry. It, it, half the time that it's used, it literally means that, that desire, that craving for sustenance, that desire for food. And, and half the time that it is used, it is referring to our physical appetite. It's talking about our hunger, that, that biological urge to, to eat. For 2,000 years ago, this, this was the center of human existence. This was, this, was, this was life as they knew it. Every day was a struggle to survive. People knew why they were hungry, because they had to eat to live. 2,000 years ago, and frankly, in most of the rest of the world today, the question everyone asks when they wake up is not, what will I eat today? The question is, will I eat today? Food was necessary for survival. And Jesus is speaking in a promissory way, an eschatological way. He's saying, you may be hungry now. You may be penao now, but you will be well fed. I promise you. And that small percentage of people who are, who are well fed now, well, they will be hungry then. And the reality is the tables will be turned and the promise was that there was a day, there would be a time that was coming when we would know what it would be to be satisfied. Now, it means a little bit different things to us today because I'm afraid we don't really know what it means to be hungry. Probably for the first time in human history, we're living in a culture where even though there are those who experience food insecurity, most of us live our lives and, and we have forgotten what food is for. How do I know that? Look at me. I am considered by the National Institutes of Health to be very overweight. That's right. I appreciate your affection. I appreciate your, oh, come on, Dave, you look fine. No, 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 no. They have a chart. It's called the Body Mass Index. It's a chart, and, and the, the people who understand these things said, uh, you take your height, and you take your weight, and you make a calculation, and if your body mass index is between 24.9 or 25.9 and 29.9, you are considered to be overweight. If you have a body mass index of 30 or greater on the body mass index chart, you are considered to be obese. I am one notch in my belt from being obese. That is such a harsh term that is so difficult for, for us to get our, our heads around because it's so hurtful. But most of the scientific studies, the Journal of American Medical Association says that 38.4% of all Americans are considered obese. They have a BMI of over 30. They predict that by the year 2040, the BMI of Americans, 50% of them, 50% of all Americans will be, will be considered obese. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the relationship that we have with food. It is the, this, this warped relationship that we have with our hunger. We hate it and we love it. In fact, the diet industry, the weight loss industry, is almost a $75 billion industry. We spend almost $8 billion a year on over-the-counter drugs to help us with weight control. That doesn't even count the billions of dollars that are spent each year on surgical remedies for obesity. The American Psychiatric Association has a term that's called dynamic eating psychology. And what they suggest is that we no longer eat because we're hungry because we're hungry for food, they suggest that most Americans eat because we're hungry for something else. 
We eat because we're bored. We eat because we're tired. We eat because we're frustrated. We eat because we're lonely. We eat because we feel guilty. And then when we, when we eat too much, we feel guilty. We feel even more guilty. And so we begin to self-medicate. And we all understand that. Because if you have a really hard day, there is nothing that feels as good as a bag of chips tastes. And so we, we kind of use food as a substitute for what we're really hungry for. Jesus was hardly a weight loss counselor, but I think he understood very well when he said, blessed are you who are hungry now, because that is the way that we are fashioned. But there is something that you will be satisfied for, that is satisfied with, that has more to do than with your bi biological hunger. But woe to you who forget, who forget what food is, that food is not a substitute for love, and food is not a substitute for affection. And I realize for many people, food is the most reliable love in their life. It is always there, and it always pleases them, and it always satisfies them. And Jesus is saying, woe to you, woe to you, whose, whose understanding of what food is for is out of whack. Because you will always be hungry. Because what you're hungry for is not the food to feed your body. It is the food that feeds your soul. Now, I realize I'm in over my depth here. We could probably spend six months talking about the, the dynamic eating psychology and, and the, the self-medication that goes on through food and drink. And, and there's, there's a whole lot there. And, I, and I'm, I'm realizing this is way too touchy a subject. But the word penao, the Greek word penao, does refer to that physical hunger. Jesus is talking about our physical appetites. Half the time that the word penao is used in the Bible, it's used to mean literal hunger. But the other half of the time that the word penao is used, it's used in a metaphorical way. It's used to, to represent something like personal Ambition. You know that, uh, that desire, that drive to succeed, that, that competitive nature. You, I think we're all familiar with that. We're all familiar with that, that intangible sense that we want to be our best, that we want to we do better than somebody else, that, that we're always comparing ourselves to one another. So how are you doing? I mean, I think my family finished Netflix this week. I think we possibly did. I didn't know that was possible. But after, you know, three months of quarantine, we've watched everything. And I even had my family watch the Michael Jordan documentary with me. Did, you, did any of you see that? It's a 10-part documentary on ESPN. It's actually quite wonderful. And it is uh, the story of Michael Jordan's last season. It's called The Last Dance. And it really is a remarkable documentary, whether you're a sports fan or not. You, you, get, you get an overdose of affirmation of what a remarkable athlete and what a remarkable competitive human being Michael Jordan was. Michael Jordan was a six-time NBA champion. He won three championships in a row, took a year and a half off to play baseball, and came back and won three more championships. And the documentary focuses on his final season Michael Jordan went 6-0 and in the NBA Finals. He went there six times and won all six times he went to the NBA Finals. In 1993, which was considered to be his finest season, the team around him was the best of all of the Chicago Bulls seasons. Of all of those six championship teams, the 93 team is considered by many to be the best. During those playoffs, Michael Jordan averaged 32.8% of his team's points. He scored a third of all of the points of his whole team. In the finals that year, he had four 40-point games in a row. But perhaps what made Michael Jordan so incredible as a competitor was he was so clutch. When the game was on the line, he wanted the ball every single time. 
in the playoffs when the game was on the line and, and the last shot in the last 24 seconds of the playoffs would determine the difference between tying and winning, seven times Michael Jordan got the ball with 24 seconds left and he made four of those shots. It's just over 50%. No one in NBA history has made more than 24% of those shots. When they were facing elimination and it came down to the last shot of the game, Michael Jordan took three of those shots and made all three. They won the championship in 1998 and there's a famous image of Michael Jordan taking a jump shot from the top of the key about 17 feet out and he has juked Byron Russell. It depends on if you're a Utah Jazz fan, you think he pushed him, but he kind of jukes Byron Russell and he goes up in the air with time running out on the clock and sinks his final shot as a Chicago Bull to win his sixth championship. It was a 17 footer from the top of the key. During that season, he had shot 32% from that range. In fact, he had the third lowest average on his team in that range of jump shot. He had missed 22 of those shots during the regular season. But when push came to shove and the championship was on the line, he rose up and made the shot and won the championship and finished his career with the Bulls as a champion. A remarkable display of, of physical gifting. But the thing you couldn't help but come away with as you watch those 10 episodes of The Last Dance was how brutally competitive Michael Jordan is. His hunger was insatiable. He never was satisfied. He always had to be the best. He always had to win. It didn't matter whether he was on the basketball court or playing cards with his friends or on the golf course. He was so relentlessly, brutally competitive. His ambition and his drive were unparalleled. Now, I've seen it. I've seen it in virtually every professional athlete I've ever met. Every one of them has that same competitive drive, that desire, that hunger to succeed. I've met it in, in successful people in business. I've met it in people who are successful spiritual leaders. They have that same ambition and drive and that hunger, whether they're artists or musicians or, 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 or CEOs or, or cab drivers. It doesn't matter. They measure their, themselves against a, an unattainable standard. I think many of us are familiar with that kind of hunger. If you're, if you're not that kind of a person, there's a pretty good chance you're married to one. We're all familiar with that. And, and it's interesting what Jesus says about that. He says exactly the opposite of what we might think. We might think that he would say, hey, you people who are hyper-competitive, you people who are relentlessly ambitious, just calm down a little bit. Just chill out. Just, just take a pill. Just rest. But no, he says, blessed are you who hunger now. That this ambition is a good thing. Because you will find satisfaction. And woe to you who are satisfied. Woe to you who are okay with, it's good enough. It's almost the opposite of what we would expect him to say. But he says that that appetite to be the best, that appetite to pursue excellence is a good thing. I've struggled with this my whole life. You know how many perfect sermons I have preached in my life? And I've preached probably, I don't know, six to 7,000 times. I've preached, you realize, I've preached here at Riverbend over 700 times. That hardly seems possible, but 700 messages. You know how many of them were perfect? Zero. Zero. None. Not one. Because I will never be satisfied. I will always seek to do my best. I will be compelled, hunger, to say, okay, I'm, I'm good. My best or nothing. I understand that appetite. I understand the weight of that. 
But does that mean that God has never been at work in any of those thousands of sermons? Do you realize that there have been times when God has used me to say the perfect thing to you, and I had no idea? In fact, that's how it operates almost 100% of the time. See, I believe that it is possible for us to find satisfaction in seeking to be the best, to find that our hunger is satisfied in the pursuit and in the process, but it is up to God to bring the satisfaction. It is up to God to bring the fruit. It is God who is the ultimate judge. We stay hungry and do our best. How do we live in the middle? How do, we, how do we deal with that metaphysical penao, that idea that, that it, it's a blessing to be hungry? I think it is the pursuit of what we have to be the best that we can be, the best moms, the best dads, the best friends, the best lawyers, the best doctors, the best truck drivers, the best school teachers but realize that it is God who ultimately measures our success. We find satisfaction in the pursuit. There is joy in the journey. But I think there's a, a final dimension of the word penao that's important for us to remember, and that has to do with our spiritual affection. We know that the word penao is referring to a spiritual hunger because it's the same word that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is the story of the Sermon on the Mount. Luke is the Sermon on the Plain. And there are similar sermons. There are sermons that Jesus had probably given dozens and dozens of times, if not hundreds of times. And he was repeating it. It was kind of his stump speech. It was the thing that he went around saying because, because he was candidating for Messiah. He was candidating to become the king of kings. And, and so, so he went around and he said the same thing. And in Matthew chapter 5, he said, Blessed are those who hunger, penao, and thirst for righteousness, for righteousness, for they will be filled. There's a, there's a spiritual hunger in us. There's a spiritual hunger. We all are saying there's got to be more than this. There has to be more. And I know we all feel it. I know we all feel it. You know how I know that we feel it? Because I see a lot of hangry people. You know what hanger is? It's not a thing you put your clothes on. Hanger is, is that, 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 that sort of short temper that you get when you're hungry. I mean, Snickers made a whole ad campaign about it. You know, you're not yourself when you're hungry. You eat a Snickers bar and you come back. Well, that's what it means to be hangry. What it means to be hangry is you, you haven't eaten all day and, and somebody asks you a question and you snap their head off and you, and you don't know why. You just, you, you're kind of out of sorts because your blood sugar is down because, because you're hangry. And you know where I see hanger all the time? In the streets of our nation in the voices of those who are crying out for their rights. It is this hunger that people have to say, we can do better. We can do better in civil rights, and we can do better in women's rights, and we can do better in, in gay rights, and abortion rights, and animal rights, and human rights, and, and we, can, we can do better. And, and they take that, that sense, that hunger, that hunger for righteousness, that hunger for more, and it comes out in all of these ways that are manifested in, in, this, in this desire to say, I want, I, I'm, I'm hungry for something better. I'm hungering and thirsting for righteousness. But you know, the interesting thing that Jesus is saying is he wasn't concerned with the cultural repair. He wasn't interested in changing the culture. He was interested in changing individuals' hearts. You see, the, the spiritual hunger that he is concerned about is not a, the, the hunger of the society. He's not interested in social justice. He's interested in individual justice. His, his candidacy 
to become the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is a campaign not because he needs to be affirmed in that role. He already is. But he's campaigning for an individual heart, yours. He is campaigning for your heart and for my heart that we might make him our Lord of Lords and our King of Kings. And he is still waging that campaign because he is, he is focused on and concerned with that individual hunger because he knows that when people are hungering and thirsting for righteousness and they are seeking that righteousness in a vital relationship with God, the social justice and the civil justice and the collective justice will be taken care of. Because for him, spirituality is a personal thing. And that's how we live in the middle, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. This is, this is where we find ourselves in, in the struggle in between the, the ideas of the physical hunger and the metaphysical hunger. Because it is about our physical appetites. That is a biological reminder of what our hunger is for. And our personal ambitions are the things that move us forward, that cause us to, to seek to be the best of us. And then the spiritual hunger that draws us near to God. It's interesting, in, in Luke's record, in Luke chapter 6, the words that he uses are, are very particular. He uses the, the word penal is in a, a present active participle. It's actually penantes. Penantes. And, and what it means is to be actively hungry. Blessed are you, and, and literally it is, blessed are you who are living hungrily, who are currently hungering, who are aware of that hunger in you. You are blessed if you are aware of that. But it's interesting, the word that he uses for those who are well-fed is a passive participle. It's empeplesmenoi. Empeplesmenoi. It's a, it's, a, it's a present passive participle. It means, woe to you who have been made to be satisfied, who have been lulled into a sense of of satisfaction, that this is as good as it gets, that this is all there is, that there is no hope for anything more. Woe to you who have found yourselves passively sitting by the side, satisfied that this is all there is. Woe to you, because your hunger will not go away. You see, we live in a world that teases us. It teases us. It tells us, it tells us you, can, you can be happy. You can be fulfilled. You can be satisfied. If you just have a little more, if you just have a little more, it'll, it'll be the best. You can put your feet up and you can rest. You can enjoy your life. We live in a world that, that seduces us, that lulls us in with this, with this passive idea that this is all there is, and this is enough. But we were made for more. We were made for better things. We ended our trip in Europe, in London, and we were going to spend a few days, Diane and I, our 40th anniversary trip last summer. We, we were going to be in London for a few days, and we had been to London one other time before, and. And I, I realized that we had been in Paris, and I had eaten the food. I had been to London before, and I thought, hey, I'm going to eat some British food. Bad idea. I mean, I've been to a pub, and I had a pint of Guinness and some fish and chips. Those are angry people. I, that didn't work for me. It just didn't make sense for me, the whole fish and chips thing. So I, so I called a friend of mine who had just been living in London, and he moved back here, and, and uh, he had been there for a number of months with his family. And I said, where did you go to eat? 
And I told him where we were going to be staying, and he said, you're right where we were, and there was this little restaurant just down from where you're staying that we went to often. It's called Il Boretto. And I said, oh, it's an Italian restaurant in, in the middle of London? He goes, yeah, it's spectacular. So uh, I called him up on the phone. No, I, I went online and I made reservations. And, and for the last night we were going to be on our trip, before we were flying back to Austin the next day, I made reservations to go to Il Barretto. And, uh, and the hotel we were staying at, the hotel we were staying at had, had uh, a Rolls Royce that if you needed transportation within a mile of the hotel, they would take you for free in the Rolls Royce. And I made sure to, they were going to take us to El Bredo. I wanted to pull up and, you know, have the whole thing going on. So we got all dressed up. My wife looked great. We were there, and we get in the rolls. I had never ridden in a Rolls Royce before. We get chauffeured to this restaurant, and we walk in. And we were early for our reservation, and, and early in England is eating dinner before, like, 9 at night. And, and we were there. There was nobody else in the restaurant, and when we kind of walked in, and I thought the Rolls Royce would impress the person, you know, greeting us, but she was kind of bothered, like, yes. I said, well, we have reservations for 6.30. And she said, name. And I said, David and Diane Haney, and she scans down her list, and she stops. And she looks at the guy next to him, next to her, and whispers something. And he takes off. And I thought she said, they came in a Rolls Royce. And I thought, this is worse scoring points right now. But, but he comes back with a guy who I think is the owner or the manager. And they just went like, oh, Dr. Haney, we're so glad to have you. Well, not in a French accent, really British. And, and they said, the table's not ready. We're getting it ready. Just be a few minutes. Have a seat at the bar. Have a cocktail on us. And so we went over there. And I said, now we're getting the French treatment. And, and so, but before I could even take a sip of my cocktail. They came back up. They said, come down here. And they let us down into this little little room down. It's kind of like a basement. And it's like a wine cellar. And, you, and you're looking at the kitchen. This table was fantastic. And so we're sitting there. And, and there's waiters coming and going. And, and a waiter comes over with a bottle of wine. And he said, this is your friend's favorite. And I went, oh, I see what's going on here. He called them. He called them and said, my friends are coming. Take care of them. And they did. And the food was great. And, and as we were about to leave, they said, no, 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 no. We have, we have dessert for you. And they brought out this plate. And they had written in chocolate, happy 40th anniversary. I'd never mentioned any of these things. But my friend had told them that this was our anniversary dinner. And they made a big fuss. And, and as we got up to leave, I'm, I'm like, waiting for the bill. I have my credit card out. And he's like, no, 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 no. Your friend took care of it. What kind of a jerk would I be if I went, well, it wasn't Guy Savoie. <laughs> it wasn't the French food. I mean, it was good. I mean, it was delicious, actually. That was one of the best meals we had the entire time we were in Europe. And the wine was great. And what kind of a person would I be if I said, well, it's not the best I've ever had. And my ingratitude, I was unable to say, thank you. Thank you so much for, for that moment, for that opportunity to, to find this, this gift, the beauty of this, of this experience. Was it the last meal I ever ate? Absolutely not. Was it the best meal I ever made? In some ways, no, and in some ways, yes. So I leave you with the question I began with. Where's your joy? You have things to be happy for? Can you find the bless in the mess? Can you find it? Is everybody enjoying themselves? So I leave you with this question. Are you happy now?